Oh, you're always pressing damn chess. The eyewitness and the godly miracle. Let's talk about one of the ancient world's celebrity miracle workers, Emperor Vespasian. In the first century CE, while hanging out in Alexandria, Vespasian reportedly performed some jaw-dropping miracles. God damn it. According to the historian Tacitus, two men approached the emperor with serious ailments. One was blind, Suck my dick, bitch. and the other had a hand that was totally useless. Suck my dick, bitch. The local physicians had their own ideas about how to treat these guys, but Vespasian, being Vespasian, decided to go on the divine route. Tacitus writes, So Vespasian, believing that his good fortune was capable of anything, and that nothing was any longer incredible, with a smiling it. countenance and amid intense God excitement it. on the part of the bystanders, did as he was asked to do. The hand was instantly restored to use, and the day again shone for the blind man. Both facts are told by eyewitnesses, even now when falsehood brings no reward. Tacitus Histories. God damn it. The ancient world was abuzz with tales of miraculous sightings and healings. Many God damn it. Attributed to the goddess. God Marius. damn it. Celsus, cited by Origen in Contra Celsum 324, claimed that a multitude of eyewitnesses attested to these miracles. Isolus, in his Peon to Asclepius, even recounted meeting Asclepius himself fucked before the gods supposedly helped Sparta win a battle. The temples of Asclepius were filled it. with inscriptions and literary works where people swore they were healed by him and even conversed with him directly. Some claim to have been resurrected by Asclepius, as Apollodorus noted in the library, God 310, damn it. 3 through 4, where he mentioned individuals damn it. who left their own accounts of these experiences. Several first hand accounts of miracles of Asclepius are documented in Wendy Cotter's Miracles in Greco Roman Antiquity. Exorcisms, too, were part of this miraculous narrative. God damn it. Josephus, for instance, documented an exorcism by a man named Eleazar who, using the wisdom and powers of Solomon, expelled the demon in the presence of Vespasian and his sons. So Miraculous claims were limited to healing and exorcisms. Alexander the Great reportedly caused the sea to recede, an event witnessed by Callisthenes and recorded in Eustathius's commentary on the Iliad, 1329. Augustus, too, was said to control the sea and weather, showcasing a divine favor that further cemented his authority. Yes. In Roman tradition, oh! witness the miraculous events associated with the death of an emperor I'm the person's particularly ass with their less ascension one minute to the times. was quite common. Damn, I One notable account home. comes from the historian. You see that dick of mine hanging out of his You see that dick, that dick of mine hanging out of his such a miracle, and, come? and even names the witness. Now these rumors began to be current at a later date. At the time, they declared Augustus immortal, assigned to him priest and sacred rites, and you named Olivia, dick, bitch. who was already called Julia and Augusta, his priestess. They also permitted her to employ a lictor when she exercised her sacred office. On her part, she bestowed a million sesterces upon a certain Numerius, Atticus, an ex-praetor, because he swore that he had seen Augustus ascending to heaven after the manner of which tradition tells concerning Proculus and Romulus. Cassius Dio, Roman History, 5646. Cassius Dio spills the tea about a senator who saw Drusilla take a celestial elevator ride up to the heavens by ascending, 
Roman History 59.11. Seneca backs this up, adding a bit of flair by mentioning a guy who witnessed both Drusilla and Claudius floating up skyward. I'm fixing it. Yeah, 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 yeah. One, two. Then there's Aurelius Victor, who narrates an event that eerily echoes the zombie-like resurrection of the saints described in Matthew 27, 52. On the other hand, the senators were not swayed by the entreaties of the emperor to accord him, Hadrian, the honor of deification. So deeply did they mourn the loss of so many men of their order. However, after those whose death they were grieving suddenly appeared, and each one embraced his relatives and friends, they sanctioned what they had refused. Just like the divine happenings around Jesus, the Roman tradition also had some pretty spectacular events when a revered figure passed away and became a god. In Rome, it was a big deal to witness the mystical powers or the ascension of the emperor. <laughs> this tradition is well documented and reminds us of the stories of Romulus and Julius Proculus. According to the tale, Julius saw Romulus return after being taken up and turned into a god. Romulus then gave Julius the task of announcing his new divine status to the world and setting up his worship. This witnessing of deified figures started a tradition. Whenever an emperor was to be deified by the Senate, a witness like Numerius Atticus was brought forward to testify to the emperor's ascension. Christians knew about these eyewitnesses, and they had some strong feelings about them. Tertullian, a Christian writer, didn't hold back his disdain. He wrote, where shall I rejoice? Where shall I exult? Watching so many kings who are reported to have been received in heaven, along with Jupiter himself, and the witnesses themselves who groan together in the depths of hell. Tertullian isn't the only one chatting about Jupiter and those ascension traditions. What we can gather is that eyewitnesses were the ultimate hype crew for boosting the fame and power of big shots, be they gods, heroes, emperors, or just no one in the stupid strong feelings about them. Tertullian, a Christian writer, didn't hold back his disdain. He wrote, Where shall I rejoice? Where shall I exult? Watching so many kings who are reported to have been received in heaven, along with Jupiter himself, and the witnesses themselves who groan together in the depths of hell. Tertullian isn't the only one chatting about Jupiter and those ascension traditions. What we can gather is that eyewitnesses were the ultimate hype crew for boosting the fame and power of big shots, be they gods, heroes, emperors, or just noteworthy individuals. Usually, these were men, though occasionally noble women, like Drusilla, got in on the action. Witnesses were like ancient paparazzi, ready to swear they saw miracles from folks who might not have even existed. Historians, with a wave of their vague hands, often called upon these supposed witnesses to back up some miraculous story about a person. Now, when it comes to the Gospels, the whole eyewitness testimony claim falls into that murky historian territory. Out of the four Gospels, only Luke and John claim they're leaning on eyewitness accounts. The other two? total silence on how they pieced their stories together. The idea that these Gospels used eyewitness testimony, or that the authors were witnesses themselves, only popped up later in the second century. Even if we roll with the idea that every claim of using eyewitnesses is somewhat legit, the 
actual usefulness of these testimonies comes with some pretty hefty hesitations requiring doubt. Inventing Witnesses and Later Church Tradition The tradition of sketchy eyewitnesses pops up in all sorts of literary works, including ancient biographies. One of the most notorious examples is Philostratus' character, Damis. Damis was supposedly a buddy of Apollonius of Tyana and claimed to have documented Apollonius' life on tablets. These tablets supposedly made their way to Julia Domna and eventually to Philostratus. But here's the catch. There's no mention of Damis or his tablets anywhere outside of Philostratus' writings. Ancient biographers had a knack for creating sources out of thin air to make their stories more believable. They often claimed to have found eyewitness documents about events or famous figures that never really existed. For example, William Hansen points out Antonius Diogenes' novel, The Wonders Beyond Thule. In its preface, Diogenes claims his novel is based on the adventures of Danius, which were inscribed on wooden tablets, discovered by Alexander the Great's troops, and later handed down to him. Hansen also mentions another supposed discovery in the Journal of the Trojan War. This work claims to be based on the account of Dizzies, a survivor of the mythical Trojan War, who supposedly wrote his story on wooden tablets. Hansen finds numerous other examples where authors likely fabricated these first-hand accounts to give their work a veneer of authenticity. In Damis' case, it's likely the same story, pure fiction. Just like Diogenes' tale, Philostratus claims that Damis' account came to him on tablets, mirroring Diogenes' story closely. Philo of Byblos probably did the same thing with his Phoenician history, claiming he translated it from an ancient Phoenician account by Sekoniathon, who supposedly lived Booker. millennia ago. Oddly God enough, damn it. this account is packed with Hellenistic historiographical tropes and conventions, God making it look more man. like a creative invention than a historical translation. One of the most famous examples of a made-up source is Plato's creative use of his ancestor, Solon. According to Plato, Solon supposedly took a trip to Egypt and learned about the traditions of Atlantis from the priests there. He then left these stories in an unfinished Greek form. Just like with many other tales, this account was passed down until it conveniently became a source for Plato's Greece and Timaeus. Scholars widely believe that Plato invented this story to suit the needs of his God, dialogues. Authors frequently make up sources to authenticate their work or to write fiction. By the second century CE, creating inventive and imaginary letters had practically become its own genre. Philostratus once again provides a prime example. His life of Apollonius is filled with these literary letters. Conveniently, while he mentions several letters, such as between Apollonius and Vespasian, or Apollonius and Musonius, the only ones history has retained are the very ones Philostratus uses in his biography, despite his claims that there were others. Caspric Notes A definite pronouncement about the authenticity of these seven letters cannot be made. God damn it. Doubtless. No coincidence that the only letters from the hero to Vespasian retained in the letters, 42 F, G, H, and 77 F, quoted in 873, are precisely those that Philostratus reproduces 
Similarly, whereas according to Philostratus, Apollonius and Musonius wrote other letters to one another, the tradition has only preserved those that the life also transmits, as if the others were simply an invention on his part. The act of selection that Philostratus claims to operate makes his documentary work credible and makes him an exemplary biographer, even though the meeting with Musonius seems to be a real legend. Coincidence is one way to describe the remarkable preservation that conveniently favored Philostratus' selected works. While the authenticity of these works is still up for debate, Philostratus wasn't the only one potentially inventing letters as sources. Fictional letters in Greek literature were a common oh, reality, yes. as mentioned earlier. This practice is part of a broader trend among many ancient historiographical authors and those of biography to invent fictional sources to validate their work. These sources were often other literary accounts or unverified hearsay. Suck my dick, Take bitch. Tacitus, Suck my dick, bitch. Vague and unknown sources were handy to cite in certain situations. As A.J. Woodman and R.H. Sutton discuss, ancient writers rarely cited their sources, but when they did, they usually referenced some vague account or author. Sometimes they did name names. This tactic was usually to boost their credibility, especially when writing something that might make readers raise an eyebrow. So inventing written sources was a pretty common move. The eyewitnesses functioned much the same way as these vague, unnamed, often fictional sources. The eyewitness was not a stable thing, but a malleable character that served the ends of a writer's work. What they actually said, as they are typically unnamed, like Luke's sources, cannot be verified. However, the mere mention of them as supporting some event or tell automatically lends credence to the work. Inventing eyewitnesses and falsely claiming to be an eyewitness were standard tropes and strategies of authentication in historiographical literature, enough so that, as M. David Litwin notes, Lucian complained about it fervently, but it was not simply pagans who were aware of this inventive tradition. Christians were aware of it as well. For example, Origen contends contra Celsus that the witnesses to Asclepius' miracles and divine healings never existed, and that as a result, the testimonies of the Christian miracles are supreme and without challenge. It was thus entirely possible. In his inventing eyewitnesses and also, to be an eyewitness were standard tropes and strategies of authentication in historiographical literature, enough so that, as M. David Litwin notes, Lucian complained about it fervently, but it was not simply pagans who were aware of this inventive tradition. Christians were aware of it as well. For example, Origen contends contra Celsus, that the witnesses to Asclepius' miracles and divine healings never existed, and that as a result, the testimonies of the Christian miracles are supreme and without challenge. It was thus entirely possible in the minds of Christians and pagans alike that an eyewitness account may be fabricated from the start though the sheer number of Asclepius accounts in particular undercut Origen's particular claim. Early Christian Witnesses and a Double Standard So was the New Testament penned by actual eyewitnesses, or at least based on their testimonies? That's a tricky question. 
We can't say for sure, but let's dive into some juicy details that might shed some light. First off, the first mentions of the Gospels being linked to their traditional authors pop up pretty late in the game. Even Simon Gathercole's recent analysis points to Papias God as the it. earliest source of these claims. However, God many it. accounts Gathercole lists, like those from Clement, the Meritorian fragment, and Irenaeus, seem to have borrowed heavily from Papias' work. It seems like the idea of who wrote the Gospels in the second century might have started with Papias and then spread like wildfire. God, fuck it. Now, was Papias working with the same gospel texts? I'm gonna we have that his work is so it's debated, bitch. but let's assume he was. Should we Shit. trust Papias' claims? Well, not necessarily. Back in the day, slapping an eyewitness label on something, or just making one up, was a common trait. For example, Papias claimed that Matthew translated from a Semitic language into Greek reminds us of other ancient tales, like Philo of Byblos, supposedly translating from Phoenician, or Solon, translating Egyptian tales about Atlantis. So it's wise to be skeptical about Papias' tradition being 100% authentic. As Robin Faith Walsh puts it, anonymity and the eyewitness tag were often just rhetorical devices not to be taken at face value. Similarly, the idea that Mark was Peter's him. interpreter jotting down his memories and sermons is reminiscent of the fictional companion Damis of Apollonius. Adding more to the mix, Papias never claimed he met the actual eyewitnesses. According to Eusebius, Papias only mentioned knowing friends or students of the apostles. Eusebius even quotes Papias, saying he got his info from these anonymous folks who supposedly had the scoop on the apostles. In a nutshell, even if Papias' claims refer to the Gospels we know today, they might be just as made up as other ancient sources used for self-authentication. In fact, there is some evidence that points to Papias being directly engaged in these inventive and anonymous witness authentication acts that we see with Greco-Roman literature. He claims, according to Eusebius, that the daughters of Philip told him wondrous tales, that one person was raised from the dead in his own time, and that Justice Barsabbas drank poison, but that God kept him from all harm. Eusebius also claims that Papias even recorded new sayings from Jesus about the end of times. This leads Eusebius to have a rather low opinion of Papias' intelligence. Papias is also infamous for reporting a story of Judas' death that is unlike any recorded in the canonical Gospels. He describes the traitor swelling up like a grotesque balloon, so massive that he couldn't even squeeze through a gap wide enough for a chariot. And then, in a finale worthy of a horror show, Judas burst open, showering the ground with his insides. Truly trustworthy reporting, right? Not. It seems like Papias was right at home with the Greco-Roman tradition of spinning creative tales and inventing eyewitness accounts. His stories might just be, well, stories. There's even a theory that Papias made up the account of Mark by claiming Mark was the author of that gospel based on the synonymous letter, 1 Peter 4.13, which he knew well. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings. So does Mark, my son. Over time, Papias himself became part of the myth-making machine, with later writers saying he acted as a scribe. Now let's assume for a second that Papias' stories aren't fictional, just 
highly imaginative, or maybe he was duped by people pretending to be friends of the disciples. Even if Papias wasn't just making stuff up, eyewitnesses back then, and even now, were more than willing to stretch the truth or attest to things they didn't actually see, but believed happened. Should we take at face value the testimonies about Asclepius performing miracles? Alexander the Great making the sea part for him? Caesar's being whisked up into heaven? Were the dead rising in mass after Hadrian's death to chat with their families? These tales show that eyewitnesses could be pretty flexible with the truth. Anonymous eyewitnesses like the ones John, Luke, and Paul mention are super handy for storytelling. They can't be verified, checked, or identified, but they add a nice touch of authority to grand claims about miraculous events from the past. As historians, though, we can't build solid cases on such anonymous accounts, especially when the Greco-Roman tradition is filled with these unverifiable witness claims used to validate all sorts of marvels. Here's a juicy tidbit for you. There's a bit of a double standard in New Testament studies. Imagine this. No New Testament scholar would hesitate to call out the miracles of folks like Vespasian, Alexander, and Asclepius as pure invention or creative storytelling by supposed witnesses or writers. They might even suggest that Tacitus just made up the whole narrative and the witnesses along with it. No biggie, right? That's what you'd expect. But when it comes to the Gospels, it's a whole different ballgame. These texts somehow dodge the same level of scrutiny. Instead of waving off the miraculous as creative liberties, scholars churn out hundreds of pages trying to justify these traditions and find reasons God to give them a free pass. It's God like the Gospels have some kind of scholarly shield protecting them God from the same skepticism God applied to Greco-Roman texts. As Justin Meggett aptly points out, this discrepancy highlights an interesting bias in the field. But New Testament scholars should concede that the kind of history that is deemed acceptable in God the field is, at best, somewhat eccentric. Most biblical scholars would be a little unsettled if, for example, they read an article about Apollonius of Tyana in a journal of ancient history that began by arguing for the historicity of supernatural events before defending the veracity of the miracles ascribed to him, yet would not be unsurprised to see an article making the same arguments in a journal dedicated to the study of the historical Jesus, referencing a miracle defense from Lycona in JSHS. So here's a wild God idea. What if we looked at the New Testament the same way we look at other Greco-Roman literature? We'd need to remember that eyewitnesses weren't exactly rock God, solid or reliable it. when it came to miracles and grand claims. Plus, those later claims about who wrote what? Often pure fiction. Papias' fragments already show some of those self-authenticating tricks of making up sources. What about the New Testament itself? Well, several texts in it falsely claim to be written by eyewitnesses or key apostles to give themselves a bit more street cred. Two of the Gospels even use eyewitness claims, but they keep things nice and anonymous, a common Greco-Roman trick to give the narrative a boost of authenticity while making sure no one could actually check the facts. Take the Gospel of Luke, for instance. It's pretty safe to say Luke's claims of using eyewitnesses are likely bogus, just mimicking the usual rhetorical strategies of Greco-Roman writers. We know he used Mark as a source, but Luke keeps that under wraps. Why? Either he didn't know the name or, more likely, he was following the Greco-Roman playbook of keeping sources anonymous to avoid verification. This shows he's using the same old tricks and supports the idea that his so-called eyewitnesses are probably made up. 
The Gospel of John pulls a similar stunt with the mysterious disciple whom Jesus loved. Scholars have spilled endless ink trying to figure out who this is. But here's the kicker. They were never supposed to figure it out. This figure was likely a rhetorical invention meant to give the narrative some fake authenticity without being verifiable. There is no real disciple whom Jesus loved to identify because the whole point was to have an unidentifiable figure who could supposedly God, back up the story as an eyewitness. Even if we give Luke and John and Paul's creed in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, the benefit of the doubt and assume their eyewitnesses were real, which we should doubt as a serious option, it doesn't change the fact that eyewitnesses weren't exactly reliable when it came to miracle claims. God damn it. History shows that eyewitnesses were more than ready to vouch for all sorts of things that didn't actually happen. God, Even if they it. sincerely believed them. Take the ascension of Caesar, for example. This was so widely witnessed that Tertullian couldn't help but chuckle at the thought of these witnesses burning in hell with Jupiter. Christians and pagans both knew that eyewitnesses could be, and often were, conveniently invented. They weren't always trustworthy. The literary tricks of Greco Roman literature give us plenty of reasons to doubt the authenticity of all the tradition about who wrote the Gospels and the supposed eyewitness no, Whether you buy into the traditional claims or not, suck my dick, these literary texts were dick, commonly bitch. used to fabricate sources and stories, making it tough to take any of these accounts at face value. Suck my dick, bitch. Eyewitnessing the conclusion. Augustus ascended into the heavens, backed up by an eyewitness. When Hadrian died, a bunch of dead supposedly rose to meet with their families, who claimed they saw and touched them. Callisthenes himself reported that the sea bent and receded at Alexander the Great's command. Eyewitnesses swore they interacted with Asclepius, witnessed his healing powers, and saw him raise the dead. Even in Tacitus' time, people claimed Vespasian performed healing miracles, proving his divine powers granted by the Roman gods. Fast forward to modern times, and we have Saint Mother Teresa performing miracles and healing people from tumors. The takeaway here is that eyewitnesses were incredibly flexible literary devices in Greco-Roman literature. They were misrepresented, invented from scratch, falsely claimed to have witnessed miraculous events, or said to have passed down stories to the author. This practice is well documented. Origen himself claimed that witnesses to Asclepius were fake, while Tertullian happily consigned those same witnesses to hell. Lucian pointed out the falsification of eyewitnesses, and various novels and historical works used vague and anonymous witnesses to verify their stories while remaining unverifiable themselves. So what does this mean for the Gospels and Paul's Corinthian Creed? While Matthew and Mark didn't claim to be based on eyewitness testimony, someone else tacked that on later, Luke and John used the same anonymous witness style as other Greco-Roman authors. Even more eyebrow-raising is Papias, who had a knack for citing unverifiable traditions supposedly known only to him or to anonymous friends of the apostles. His approach is strikingly similar to these creative literary practices. Alright, let's play along and assume these traditions are spot on with eyewitnesses behind these tales. What stands out is that these eyewitnesses, whether they're talking about Vespasian, Alexander, Asclepius, or any other ancient celebrity, given the power and, seemingly, the duty 
to vouch for events that either didn't happen or were exaggerated to glorify their heroes. So even if the Gospels and Paul did lean on eyewitness accounts, it doesn't bring us any closer to believing in the historicity of Jesus' miracles than it does for the miracles attributed to Vespasian, Alexander, Asclepius, Augustus, Hadrian, Apollonius, Drusilla, Claudius, Romulus, and so on. Miracles were a dime a dozen, and so were the supposed witnesses, even for figures and events that never existed. We simply can't take these ancient miracle stories at face value. I'm dick of these fucking we're supposed to trust the eyewitnesses in the Gospels, whether named or anonymous, then we should also trust the eyewitnesses of the countless other miracles, visions, and ascensions in the ancient Greco-Roman and other traditions. The Suck fact that we don't bitch. take pagan traditions seriously means we should apply Suck the same skepticism bitch. to the New Testament. These eyewitnesses were just like any others, either creative or completely fabricated. Thanks to Chrissy Hansen for her brilliant research in this video. We at Myth Vision truly appreciate her efforts and hope you enjoyed this education. Please be sure to like the video so that YouTube gods have eyewitness to the mortals' appreciation of this content. Just maybe, they will take us up into the heavens via ascension and make this go viral. Leave a comment with your name as the source or anonymously and share this video with others the same way you would be seen to pass along his stories. Please consider joining our Patreon and YouTube membership family to continue making these videos possible. We could really use your help. Also take your learning to new levels by signing up for one of the scholarly courses we have at www.mvp-courses.com. We have several different courses by scholars. You stupid trucker. This video, like Robin Faith Walsh, with I'll her hope courses on the Apostle like Paul and stupid the Gospels, trucker. she really gets it. Also, we have a course with M. David Litwa on the mystery religions of the Greco-Roman world, even comparing them to early Christianity. There are several more academics who are in the vein of this work that we have courses by, such as Ernest Ron McDonald and Richard C. Miller which go into the Greek and Roman sources. But Richard Miller covers the eyewitness trope and many other translation fable tropes for Christian origins. If you sign up, you are on the courses for life. We are very thankful for all you do and hope you never forget. We are Myth Vision. You suck my dick, bitch. God damn it. God fucking damn it. God damn it. God damn it. God fucking damn it. Now fuck I've been bringing this bitch to run here. Suck my dick, bitch. Come on, you fucking bitch. Come on, you fucking bitch. You stupid motherfucker.
God fucking damn it. God damn it. God damn it. Challenge our neurons while making friends and having a whole lot of fun. Surprise everybody turns out at 9 o'clock in the morning <laughs> on a Sunday. Damn! Damn! It's new. Damn! Damn! Now I don't know who thought I was a morning person. This is about three hours after my bedtime. <laughs> anyway, uh, many years ago, I listened to an interview with uh, somebody who was a bodyguard or a chief of security or something like that for Oral Roberts. And that's the famous televangelist in Tulsa who uh, ran the City of Faith and who once saw a, he saw a vision of a 900 foot Jesus raise the City of Faith. And he, so he told, uh, 900 feet by the way, that's big enough to take on Godzilla and Cthulhu. <laughs> but he, uh, he told his people that uh, he wanted his congregation to to give him eight million dollars, or else God was going to kill him because God is an extortionist. <laughs> Makes perfect sense. And what does God need the eight million dollars for? Is he going to feed starving children in some war torn country? No, 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 no. God never does anything for those people. Uh, God threatened to kill Oral Roberts. If, he, if Oral Roberts could not raise the money to build his City of Faith project. So God threatened to kill Oral Roberts if, if his followers didn't give Oral. Wait. <laughs> Just had to check my script. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> God threatened to kill Oral Roberts if Oral Roberts' followers didn't give Oral Roberts the money that Oral Roberts wanted to build, Oral Ro build onto Oral Roberts' property. So this isn't about what God wanted. It's all about what uh, Oral Roberts wanted. You know, God didn't have any interest in this at all. Fuck those children. Can you pull the microphone closer? I wanted to, but they put it here. <laughs> yeah. Microphone closer. I wanted to, but they put it here. <laughs> said, you know, give me the money that I wanted so that I can do what I want with it, and if you don't give it to me, then I'm going to hold my breath and stamp my feet. And then when it came down to the wire, and it looked like they weren't going to make the, uh, the required amount by the deadline, then there was an announcement that God might barter down. Because God is such a coward when it comes to making a deal. It's Sunday, where's my money? Oh, this is all you got? Well, that's fine. You can, I can spot you for the rest. We'll forget. Does that sound like the God of the Bible? That guy's an ass. So it shouldn't matter if God killed Robert because he was then 69 years old and, and he's a servant of God and he's worried that God is going to call him home. Where's the threat there? You know? Uh, most of the people giving this $8 million all live in trailers anyway. Keep your money. Anyway, um... It wouldn't have mattered if God had killed Oral Roberts because Roberts was not only a faith healer, he was also a necromancer. <laughs> uh, yeah.
Jeez. Robert claimed, Robert Roberts claimed to have brought a dead baby back to life to the cheers of his believers, of course. Until fact checkers pointed out that no one had actually declared that baby to be dead in the first place. Which kind of ruined the miracle. When he had to admit that all he really did was awaken a sleeping baby. We the parents of the thought we would have a moment of rest ourselves, but thanks to you, no we don't. Not anymore, damn it. So anyway, this, this security officer, or whatever he was in the interview that I was listening to, explained how he wanted to believe, but that he just couldn't go on faith alone. I mean, he, he needed, he couldn't just make believe whatever he was told to believe simply because he was told to believe it. He had to have a reason, a verifiable fact to justify that belief. And I feel the same way. I mean, there's lots of stuff I want to believe, but no amount of faith will turn a false belief into, into a fact. Uh, although Jesus seems to have had the opposite opinion. Jesus told his followers that if they just believed hard enough, that they could make fantasy become reality. That if you have enough faith, and you're absolutely convinced of your own mystical power, then you could tell that mountain to jump into the sea, and it would be in the sea. There's no reason to believe that, and it goes against all reason, because mountains don't listen. <laughs> they don't hear you, they don't follow verbal commands, and they can't jump. But what if a mountain could jump into the sea? What if Christians jump, be in the sea, and then the mountain is suddenly in the sea? What happens to the coastal communities on the opposite shore? God damn it. You know, if Jesus was correct, Christians would be causing tsunamis all over the world. Hebrews 11.1 says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. That's circular reasoning. That's the question-begging fallacy, which is ubiquitous throughout all religions. You assume you're right because you believe you're right, and you won't ever question whether you're right, nor will you try to find out because you'll also never admit when you're wrong. God damn it. That's how faith works. Religious tradition requires faith because religious leaders don't want believers to have or to use reason. Remember what Jesus said to his apostle Thomas. He said, you believe because you've seen the evidence, but blessed is he who has not seen and yet believed. So what's that mean? If you base your belief on evidence, then fuck you. You're not going to laugh. Oh, you not stupid magic, motherfucker. Unless you blindly believe whatever fool thing I said just because I said so. When you were a little kid, did your parents ever say, because I said so, that's why? If that answer wasn't good enough for a child, how is it good enough for an adult? But you have to believe it. And believe it completely, without question, reservation, or reason. Otherwise, you may be accused of blasphemy, heresy, or apostasy, and all of those carried a death sentence when Christianity was in charge, you know, before we secured a secular government where we had free thought and critical inquiry. Uh, my state of Texas wants to ban both of those things, by the way, because the point of Abrahamic religion is forced conformity. <laughs> opposing opinions can be criminalized. I've heard a lot of Christians say that there's science in the Bible, but no, there ain't. Not only is everything the Bible says about science laughably wrong, but uh, the practice of science means questioning your assumptions and then testing them not because you're right, because you can't prove it wrong. That's against the rules. Uh, but uh, it, 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 but it, and we did, if we did that, then we would be susceptible to confirmation bias, just like religion is. So um, we do the opposite instead and try to prove our perspective wrong and then only tentatively accept what we haven't been able to prove wrong rather than claiming something to be the absolute fact until you can prove it wrong because that's thinking backwards, which is what religion does. Ah, but Jesus says, no, no, no. Thou shalt not put the Lord thy God to the test because Jesus believed in arguments from authority wherein alleged authorities cannot be questioned because we assume that they're never wrong, that they're, not even when they fail to deliver on their prophecies and promises. For example, in Mark 11.24, 24, 
Jesus says, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. What's he saying? What's he asking you to do? What does it mean to, to, to believe that you have received it? He's asking you to pretend. Yeah, pretend that you got whatever you asked for. Then it will be yours. Because you ain't getting it otherwise. And that's what faith is all about. Pretending. Sometimes it's pretending as if you know things you don't know. Other times it's pretending you already got it. You still ain't got it. That's why I have to keep telling believers in my family to stop reading off their bank information to some scammer on the phone. If you really want the publisher of Sweepstakes Clearinghouse, their website says that they will show up unannounced with a big damn check. Their website says they will not call you in advance to tell you some bullshit like, yeah, well, before you can get your $50,000, you have to pay us $400 on the taxes or a winner's fee or something. That's not how, that's not how publisher of Sweepstakes work. That's not how prizes work. That's how scams work. Oh, but then I'm the bad guy. Because I'm the unbeliever, the infidel who caused the faithful to stumble in a crisis of faith. Because they thought it was really real. They believed it with their whole heart, so they knew it to be real. And then I ruined it with my lack of faith. I jinxed it. Because if I just believed like they did, then it would still be real. As if it was real when they believed it. And it didn't stop being real until I dispelled the illusion. If I hadn't said anything, if I hadn't walked in when I did to catch them reading off their account numbers, if I didn't know what they were doing, then they would have gotten that money. Because they believed they received it. And that makes it my fault that she got scammed. Now, fuck so it's my fault that instead of spending her <laughs> notify her bank to change her accounts, and now we have to report yet another fraud to the FBI to be for the shit again. You fell for that like a second time to do some shit. The interview that I was listening to Stupid on my car fucker. on a road trip somewhere. The guy running Oral Roberts' uh, security detail, if I remember correctly, apparently had some degree of police training, enough that uh, he was inclined to investigate when things seemed suspicious. So here he was, working for one of the most famous faith healers in the world at that time. Oral Roberts had been healing people for decades. So this security officer asked Oral Roberts for one name, one person out of all of those in that congregation that he could look into and see that uh, their medical <laughs> records or the Brown family would, ex would, would verify that this person had been you know, in a wheelchair or whatever, had some irreversible chronic condition for, you know, for so many years or whatever until Oral Roberts laid his hands upon them and they were healed forever after that. That's all he wanted. However, Roberts dodged the question time it was asked. So the guy kept asking, <laughs> earnestly and sincerely, until eventually, Roberts replied in frustration, there's a lot of exaggeration in this business. Now, let's ignore, for the moment, the relevant fact that religion is a business. We'll even ignore this man's testimony, wherein Oral Roberts tacitly admitted that he was a fraud that in his decades of his decades long career as a faith healer he had never actually healed anyone not physically anyway at most you could say that he healed them spiritually <laughs> Which means he, he didn't really heal them it's just but they want to pretend that he did they really wish they could pretend that he did now right. today we're talking about the exaggeration <laughs> which leads to embellishment both of which are necessary to any account of religious experiences. I've often been told that if I just read the Bible or the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita that I will believe. Or that if I ask God to reveal himself to me, then he will. But only if I ask him sincerely with my whole heart. Meaning that if I only want to winnow fact from falsity to better understand whatever is really true rationally, then that means my heart is hardened. And God will not reply under those circumstances. Uh, the only way God will reveal himself is if I already have a deep-seated emotional need to believe, such that I might still believe, even if it's not really true. I've met several people like that. 
Even then, when God reveals himself, as believers report, he doesn't appear before you to speak to you like any real person would. Other gods do that. Even lesser gods do that. I know a guy who worshipped the Egyptian cat-headed goddess Bast because, he said, she appeared to him in his house, physically manifest, visible, audible, tangible. She gave him a hug and asked him to become her disciple. And I understand how compelling that could be. I mean, there was this, there was this, there was this nice young lady that showed up at my door. She was running for state senate. She was there. She, there, she, there she is in person, standing on my step, asking me to vote for her. I did, and she won, because mine's the only vote that counts. So, just think about it. When, when a goddess with a cat's head shows up in your house, topless as she is commonly depicted, and asks you to worship her, you know, well, you do. <laughs> These lesser characters are more approachable, but God, Yehovah, El Allah, Yahweh, he's too famous for that. Getting a response from him is like getting a form letter from somebody that you know has never heard of you. Although, the people who keep getting scammed in my family honestly think that they're receiving correspondence from Donald Trump. <laughs> when you ask the Abrahamic God to reveal himself that instead of a personal appearance or really any kind of intelligible reply at all, you're expected to imagine the slightest calming effect. Uh, a, a gentle breeze, a, a ray of sunshine, anything like that, or even anything less than that. Whatever subjective impression or assumption it is, you have to seize on that and exaggerate it out of sheer credulity into God revealing himself through whatever sign you can imagine. Figure out some poetic way to spin it later. You've done the deed, and now you can tell the judge that they don't have to hold you accountable because God has already forgiven you. For a lot of people, becoming a believer is as easy as asking God to reveal himself and then thinking, well, of course God exists because I don't understand things, therefore magic. <laughs> you don't describe it like that when you're still a believer. I didn't. Y'all didn't. Many of us tried to believe. Some of us did believe. We didn't describe our belief that way. Uh, not back then. But if you used to hold a, a fundamentalist view, a, a belief in a magical, excuse me, supernatural <laughs> creation uh, over evolution or cosmogony, and we have since come to reconsider or so ultimately discard that belief, then as we now reflect on our past position, then yeah, that was pretty much belief in magic. The point is that even your own circular assumptions can be exaggerated into God talking to you through your preconceived biases. You know, William Lane Craig argued in his ridiculous book, The Oxymoronic Title of Reasonable Faith, he said that when a person refuses to come to Christ, it is never because of a lack of evidence or because of intellectual difficulties. But we willingly ignore and reject the drawing of God's Spirit on our hearts. That's what he says. But not only is that not true of everyone, that's never been true of anyone. Yeah. Uh, and it certainly doesn't make sense to the, you know, the many of us who were once faithful believers. I'm on the board of directors of American Atheist 501c3. Seth and I both are. The vast majority of our membership uh, were once Christian. Some of us were Muslim and some of us bounced through different faiths before realizing that faith itself is the problem. To my experience with nearly every one of our board members, speakers, activists, and assorted conventioneers, we were not lazy in our faith. We didn't fall from grace by sliding down some slippery slope, certainly not out of our love of sin, whatever the fuck that means. <laughs> when you talk to Seth, do you get the impression that Seth loves sin? We're not talking about what you might think of me, we're talking about him. <laughs> The fact is that many of us were committed believers who didn't just read the scriptures, we studied them more deeply than most Christians, even in the clergy. We didn't just talk the talk, we walked the walk. And look how many of the best advocates for atheism began as professional preachers and missionaries and ministers and seminary students, or like Seth, who was in Christian radio broadcasting for much of his life. As you know, I went another way. I told you all about this when I was here last year. Please forgive 
a short recap. Uh, yes, I was a reborn Christian once, for a few hours, one day in 1981. <laughs> until my minister said to just keep telling yourself it's Jesus until you believe it. Uh, because his admission of that, that, that faith was just a matter of lying to yourself, you know, that, that, that kind of caused my Christianity to die and rebirth. One might even say that I was still born in Christ. <laughs> but for those who think they were born again, how does that work? Well, well, this wasn't the case for me. I was just doing it because my friends were doing it and I wanted to remain spiritually aligned with them. But I know that in a lot of other cases, if you weren't already raised to be that way, and sometimes even if you were, it usually happens when you're at your lowest point, riddled with guilt and shame and confusion at where it all went wrong. Because you're young and dumb and full of... Well, not that. Well, maybe that, depending on how naughty you were. But <laughs> And in all the wrong places. The point is that your intellect has failed you. Your life isn't working out the way it needs to. You don't know how to fix it. You're desperate. And this is when, as some evangelicals say, that faith has to circumvent the intellect to speak to emotion, the heart. And this is especially true when you're trying to beat an addiction. <laughs> religious conversion works in that case because studies have shown that exercising religious belief in, uh, enhances or even, what is it, uh, produces the same endorphins as a chemical addiction. So you can literally get high on God. And it doesn't matter which God. I think that's significant. In any case, you're literally trading one addiction for another. So at that moment, when many people see no other possible solution and they need one immediately, you utter the incantation, wherein you swear your devotion to your new favorite version of some foreign deity. Whether you declare that there is only one God and Muhammad is his prophet, or, you, or that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, or you dedicate your life to Bast or to the pursuit of Krishna consciousness, whatever it is, the moment you say that, especially if you say it in front of witnesses, then that is the moment that, that, that you expect to remember as the instant when it all changed. I've since read the testimonies of believers of other faiths talking about that moment when they spent time and that their whole life turned around to the moment that she accepted Buddha into her heart. And the way out of faith is not as fast as the way in. The way in is an incantation, an act of a moment. The way out is more like trying to find your way out of the woods in the dark when you know that you get back to your tent, your campsite when you know that the campfire is already out. It takes a while. And some of you all may be embarrassed that you used to believe in a talking snake and a floating zoo and a flood over mountaintops, but at least you have the advantage that millions of other people believed in that too, and a whole lot of them still do, so you can't feel too stupid about it. <laughs> I, on the other hand, believe things no one else believed, which is why I don't talk about that. These were my own hypotheses on the workings of the supernatural realm. And I don't like to talk about it because I'm frankly embarrassed that I used to be one of those hippies that were all around me, like back in Los Angeles when I grew up as a kid in the 60s and 70s, when everyone was all about heightened levels of mystical spiritualism, dude. <laughs> um, as you know, I took the route of neo-pagan spiritualism, or consciousness which actually began with the study of Eastern religions. Why? Because I was a Beatles fan as a teenager, and I remember George Harrison using the argument that if there's a God, I want to see him. It's pointless to believe in something without proof, and Krishna consciousness and meditation are methods where you can actually obtain God perception, and, and, and that way you can see, hear, and play with God. Perhaps this may sound weird, but God is really there, next to you. And remember that when he says God. He's talking about Sri Krishna. So, I resolved that I wouldn't take Harrison's word for it, even though he was my favorite Beatle. Instead, I would do pretty much as he did and find out for myself by seeking to experience the supernatural firsthand. And I just remember that back then, it seemed as if everyone believed in something supernatural. Even Gene Roddenberry, who was an atheist who wrote Star Trek, even he believed in you know, telepathy and telekinesis, remote viewing, psychic and all of that because a lot of the stuff that there was scientific evidence for this shit back then back before the internet when you could just look up everything right now you know and know better you know we thought that uh, parapsychology was a thing we thought that they were actual, actual 
people with PhD degrees that had bottle or var jars of ectoplasm on their evidence shelves. Yeah. My approach was to explore transcendental meditation and other recall practices in an attempt to see for myself whether there was any truth to this and what it might be, as I still thought there was some truth to all this. And I know I've told you all this here, this God question, it. part of that is relevant now too. So how does the practice of New Age spiritualism work? Well, let's say that you're just trying to read someone's aura. That's pretty basic. What is an aura? Well, there's this pretty lady named Teal Swan, uh, who is quite a popular New Age spiritualist with a couple million subscribers on her YouTube channel, which I guess makes her the leading authority on this in lieu of any experts in this field at all. And um, she says that auras are essentially a field of subtle, luminous electromagnetic radiation surrounding a physical thing. At this point, it's important to note that this alleged electromagnetic radiation cannot be measured in wavelengths, frequencies, amps, ohms, volts, watts, rats, candle power, nor by any other means known to man. They can't be imaged by any device, not even the ones that can see into the broader spectrum of invisible light from infrared to ultraviolet. All these devices can do is detect gamma rays and radio waves, things that are produced by physical photons. Now, this type of electromagnetic radiation is neither electrical nor magnetic. It is allegedly extra-dimensional and therefore uh, consequently immeasurable by any physical device. This radiation is a spectral manifestation that can only be detected spiritually by a psychic using extrasensory perception. What does extrasensory perception mean? It's when you train yourself to disassociate from your physical dimension to open your third eye chakra of physical psychic awareness of the multiple overlapping dimensions vibrating at non-physical frequencies or resonance. Dude. Teal Swan is kind of amazing because she can talk for quite a while with absolute confidence and unrivaled authority without ever saying anything that is either verifiable or falsifiable. There's no way she's right. Absolutely no data supports what she's saying at all. But at the same time, there's no way to prove her wrong either. And that's, the, that's why the burden of proof has to be on the one making the positive claim. Show me the truth to it or admit there is no truth to it. As some primitive traditions believe that everything has a spirit, even, even rocks. And likewise, Teal Swan believed that it. all things have an aura. I, however, was under the impression that the only living things could generate an aura. And the way I understood it was this immeasurable energy was a force created by all living things, just like Obi-Wan Kenobi said. God. Because an aura is the energy emanating from a spiritual being, which also transmits information. Which, again, only a psychic can see or understand because the information is spiritual, not physical, not real. Yeah, if you don't want to trust the psychic blindly, the only thing you can do is yeah, suck it and move this whole man here. How do you do that? Don't stick my dick in the uh, Well, let's see. Uh, the easiest way, if you want to use your physical eyes, is to have your subject stand about six or more feet away, ideally against a blank white background. And then you can uh, use uh, you can use other avenues of perception beyond sight. Perhaps you could stretch out your feelings. <laughs> Close your eyes and then visualize what shape or color the aura is. Use your third eye, the one in the middle of your whole forehead, the one you imagine, the one that isn't really there. But if you're a beginner, like I was, having to rely on vision, then pick a focal point. Suck my dick. Stare into their third eye chakra. And then God damn it. Uh, relax your gaze while you, you keep your physical eyes where they are and move your mind's eye to the periphery, and uh, you, as, your, as your eyes tire of focusing on what you're not looking at, you begin to see a fuzzy haze around the, the borders of their physical being, different shapes and colors. Suck my God that damn it. is what the God aura is. You're starting, to stare, you're starting to see into the all spectrum, the auric field God surrounding your subject, damn it. which is barely perceptible against the white of the wall. And God the longer you stare, it. the more weary your eyes become. The more you'll notice colored fields 
some shapes against that white wall surrounding and overlapping your subject. Yeah, the more you can bring that this, in here. The more adept or susceptible you'll become at perceiving or imagining different dimensions of this energetic fields that can't be measured in any of the ways that we measure or recognize energy. The problem with that is multifaceted. First of all, we know that if you stare at anything like that long enough, you will eventually see color distortions in the periphery, regardless whether there's an undetectable energy there or not. And then, not even string theory allows for the kind of, of overlapping dimensions that, that these spiritualists are talking about. So there's no actual factual evidence for it, and no way to adequately test it, nor is there any way to falsify it. Because if two people focus on the same subject at the same time, and see different colored auras representing opposing vibrations, both of them are told that that's no problem because the differences in perception are due to the level of aptitudes in each of the psychics involved. Maybe it's core. As if they're both perceiving the same subject but at different depths. Thus, even entirely different and violently conflicting interpretations can both be considered correct, even when they're apparently just doing cold reading like any other fake psychic would. That's uh, ultimately why I became frustrated with my own exploration of spiritualism. There was never anything measurable or testable or reliably consistent, nothing to confirm that there was ever a there, there. There was no truth to any of it, meaning nothing we could objectively show to be true. So let's get away from psychics for a moment and look at prophets, which are basically the same thing. Does anybody remember what was supposed to happen on uh, May 21st, 2011? That was the day that Christian radio show host Harold Camping said that there's going to be a terrific earthquake, way bigger than anything the earth has ever experienced, and that will be the beginning of Judgment Day. It was supposed to be that at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, the earth would crack open, killing millions of people and flinging corpses out of their graves directly into heaven. God damn it. Some of Camping's followers were so upset by this that they took extreme measures. One woman murdered her children to save them from Satan. How that works, I don't know. Another elderly gentleman spent his entire life, his entire life savings on billboards advertising the coming doomsday. And there's this hilarious photo of him at Times Square. He's looking at his watch, confused, because it's 6.02, and nothing's happened, and there's this huge crowd around him, and they're all laughing their asses off, as this senior citizen is now penniless in his declining years. Because as every unbeliever accurately predicted, the apocalypse never came. But importantly, Harold Camping's ledger was leaked to the internet, and it showed that before the end of the world, he was already scheduling appointments for after the end of the world. <laughs> for donations and business meetings and things like that. So he knew it wasn't going to happen. So he's predicting something he knows is not going to happen and he's ruining people's lives over it. Absolutely no moral compunction at all. He just lied to his listeners and gave them something fun to pretend while they ruined their lives in response. And the more important message here is that when Harold Camping was confronted about why his prophecy has failed, he argued that no, it happened. All of that happened. It just happened spiritually. I'm just no ear your work. The most dramatic, <laughs> the greatest earthquake in geological history happened spiritually so that nobody felt it. Killing millions of people spiritually. Which I guess is why a lot of people's spirituality died that day. So let's look at another example. In 2014, American atheists held their national convention in Salt Lake City, Utah. And there were some Christian protesters outside predicting the end. Not of the whole world necessarily, but at least of the U.S. economy. Uh, there were a number of pro uh, protesters who told me that this would happen as a result of the fourth blood moon tetrad that was supposed to occur on September 23rd, 2015. And there were several people across the internet who predicted the end of human civilization at the hands of a comet that was supposed to hit on that day. 
But this particular guy said that only the US, U.S. economy would collapse, such that the dollar would become worthless. And to be more specific, because I pressed him on this, I want to know how we're going to falsify this prediction, because the one thing prophecies do is fail. You just have to see how. So he told me that on that day, if his prophecy is fulfilled, then it will not be possible for us to walk into a restaurant and buy dinner, because there won't be any value to the dollar. There just won't be any, any economy going at all. So I got him to agree on camera that on or after that day, that uh, if his prophecy failed, that he has to buy me dinner. <laughs> he, he offered to buy me dinner if it fails. But I asked for one more thing. I want him to admit that he was wrong and all that that implies. However, on September 29th of that year, 18 months later, I posted a video calling him out and messaged him directly about that. I gave him my PayPal address and told him that was a cheap date. He only owed me $25 for dinner. But I was more interested in his admission that he was wrong and acknowledgement that his prophecy had failed, that it did not come true. He replied, but did not keep his word. Can you imagine what he told me? Instead, he said that uh, what he predicted actually came true, exactly as he said, but that it only happened spiritually. Which I now have to interpret as meaning that it didn't happen in reality. It only happened as in, in his imagination. Thus, I am now of the, of the opinion that uh, faith in spirituality is not even connected with reality that is entirely a product of the imagination, and that's, uh, that's the Christian faith and the faith of neo-pagans, even my own, when I was either of those things. And it also of my friend who worships fast. Because I'm beginning to suspect the remote possibility that perhaps a bare-breasted babe with the head of a talking cat might not have actually teleported into his living room. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I'm, I'm beginning to think that that particular ancient Egyptian deity appeared to him only spiritually. <laughs> Although knowing this guy, to be fair, there's also the possibility she may have appeared to him chemically. <laughs> Maybe even pathologically. <laughs> this brings us to something that I wanted to talk okay, about. Okay, that's it. Let me draw this a bit more. I have or forgotten that I have ever heard. And that's saying something, because I've been arguing with believers almost every day for a quarter century since before Y2K. So, uh, buckle up for this one. We are told that in 1917, three Portuguese children, shepherds, because they don't go to school, had a vision of the Virgin Mary. Well, really, it was just the 10-year-old girl who saw or spoke to the apparition. The, the younger siblings were just there to, to smile and nod and say, yeah, whatever, and go along with it. The story is the Lady of the Rosary told this kid a handful of prophecies, all of them saying, well, if this happens, then this other thing will be the likely result, which, which isn't really a prophecy, is it? Because that's the Virgin Mary tacitly admitting that she doesn't know whether this or that will happen. And the one significant prediction mentioned that Russia might become an atheist state. And to be fair, this was before the Soviet Union had adopted that policy. But then I remember uh, our senator, Newt Gingrich, when he said that Muslims were atheists who worship the devil. <laughs> and Protestants often say that Catholics aren't really Christians, but pagans, and ancient pagans invented the word atheist to describe early Christians. So it's actually common for believers of one religion to say that another religion is godless. Especially in a case like this, when we're contrasting Portuguese Catholics with Russian Orthodox. Those two had already been at war a couple of times. Uh, fun fact, uh, Vlad the Impaler, Dracula, the historic Dracula, fought on both sides of that war. Just an interesting factoid. Anyway, these, these three kids were allegedly instructed that God would perform a miracle on October 13th of that year, right in their little field. Uh, and why was God going to do that? 
so that more people would believe. So God is going to produce a public spectacle, miracle, invite all your friends. God's going to show up and do something. What? We don't know. God is entirely too vague. So vague that his prophecies don't even count as prophecies. <laughs> but if that was the motive to get, to get more people to believe, then I have to wonder why is it that God will only give a private audience and then only to the least credible people for miles around? Usually folks that can't even read. Then he trusts these questionable incompetents to spread his message in a game of telephone and always with no evidence whatsoever, which never works out right. It always ever, only ever leads to greater conflicts and confusion with only religions to pop up, you know, go to war with. But uh, Mr. Infallible Omniscience still hasn't recognized the pattern of perpetual failure and will not correct it either. He keeps doing the same thing, expecting different results, which either means that God is insane, or the people who think they're talking for him are insane. Because it really seems like God is not actually there, and that these ignorant but imaginative make-believers are just wittingly or unwittingly making shit up. The newspapers got a hold of the story and promoted it, so that on that day, somewhere between 30,000 to as many as 70,000 people showed up in this field to see the promised miracle, whatever that was supposed to be. And remember that this was Western Europe a century ago. Not only were any of these poor farmers and sheep herders undereducated and extremely religious Catholics, they were also emotionally distraught, believing that the end of time, the end of the world was nigh. Like every generation always God thinks damn it. But this was during the First World War which was an unprecedented escalation